Next on AMC, travel back to Ireland in the 1800s with Douglas Fairbanks Jr. for an exciting swashbuckling adventure he also co-wrote, The Fighting O'Flynn, next on AMC. My name is Lafitte. He went by many names. That fucking of you, pirates, dressed up monkey on a stick. Yeah. Privateer. He had a way with the women, and a way with his men. Sewer bred rats. Frederick March is Jean Lafitte, the swashbuckler who stole gold, jewels, and the heart of every bell in New Orleans. The hero who won the War of 1812. Don't miss Cecil B. DeMille's The Buccaneer, Thursday on AMC. America, 1812. While General Andrew Jackson guided his troops against the British, Buccaneer Jean Lafitte and his perilous pirates terrorized the high seas. Ewell Brenner and Charlton Aston join forces in the colorful and lavish remake of Cecil B. DeMille's 1938 epic adventure. Anthony Quinn makes his directorial debut with The Buccaneer, Thursday on AMC. Coming soon on AMC. Just another trouble. You told me not to come on the boat. Good night, kid. Good night. Ah, that's what everybody thinks who's never been there. Look. Skipper, believe it or not, there's a little calm. What? A little calm? How little? Coming soon on AMC. Here's the kind of movie you've been waiting to see as John Ford and Miriam C. Cooper present Mighty Joe Young. 
whose sensational exploits will startle you, thrill you, electrify you with hair-raising excitement and suspense. See mighty Joe Young as he savagely resists capture in his native Africa. Oh! Joe! Joe! See the most fantastic relationship between beast and beauty. A mere girl mastering a primitive giant. See mighty Joe Young, enraged by Hollywood pranksters, destroy Filmland's swankiest nightclub on the fabulous Sunset Strip. Mighty Joe Young, the picture that's alive with the most sensational action thrills ever filmed. Mightier than King Kong, Mighty Joe Young. is a large unidentified object circling the earth at incredible speed. AMC presents a science fiction classic. We have come to visit you in peace and with goodwill. We'll get him, alive if possible, but we must get him. He's a menace to the whole world. Michael Rennie, Patricia Neal, and Sam Jaffe star in Robert Wise's groundbreaking The Day the Earth Stood Still. That too, Murata, Nick Toe. Premiering Saturday, September 3rd, 5 p.m. Eastern, only on AMC. 500 years from now, this is a valuable legacy for people to come and look back at. And if you, if you can't see it and can't find it, what a great record of how we felt during World War II. What the United States was like during Vietnam. What happened when Russia gave up communism for the first time in how many years and, 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 and things changed. Here's historically what was going on in the United States. Here's how people thought. This is the way they dressed. This is the way they spoke. This is what they admired. This is what they hated. This is what they read. This is the music that they played. This is what they thought was dramatic. This is what they thought was boring. And that's, you know, you can't put a price on that. That's a valuable, valuable heritage. by a huge national ad campaign, crowds flocked to the joint benefit premieres of The King and I. And at the New York debut of the Darrell Zanuck presentation, His Excellency Pote Saracen, Thailand's ambassador to the U.S., represents the country that is the setting of the Rogers and Hammerstein classic. With the masterly collaborators here to see Mayor Wagner accept a check for the over $30,000 that was realized for the Police Athletic League. Concurrently at Hollywood, another glittering crowd is attracted to the Yul Brynner co-starring vehicle to be thrilled at seeing Rex Thompson, co-star Deborah Carr's son in The King and I, attending with his real-life mother. And here is the dual debuting Cinemascope 55 Films producer, Charles Brackett, with wife and grandson. As Rita Moreno, The King and I's tragic Toop Tim, attends with Sam Gilman. Producer Buddy Adler has the newlyweds, Dana Winters and Greg Boutser as his guests. To be followed by the King and I director, Walter Lang, and a party that includes Dick Egan, Pat Hardy, Jane Russell, and Bob Waterfield. While Ernie Borgnine appears with Anita Louise, president of the UCLA Medical Center Auxiliary, which reaps the entire proceeds of this Hollywood gala. You're watching American Movie Classics. The American West, a place of beauty, a time of danger. 
where men preferred action over words. Get on your horse. The lawman's code was simple. If you're gonna shoot, you shoot to kill. And every day was high noon. Get your gun. I'll meet you in the street in five minutes. The legends of the American West are many. And now, their stories can be told. So you're the famous Wyatt Earp. Saddle up with American movie classics and the biggest stars in the western sky for Cowboy Classics. Next time on Cowboy Classics, it's Charlton Heston and Jack Palance, the cowboy versus the Apache. Don't miss fast-paced action in the western thriller Arrowhead on the next Cowboy Classics, Saturday at 7 p.m. Eastern, only on AMC. Uh, Douglas Fairbanks, Jr., it seems, needed a castle for his production of Fighting O'Flynn. Uh, he was acting as producer and actor. Uh, now, he just didn't want any castle, though. It had to be Castle Knockmore, and that presented a couple of problems. Sometimes, when a producer runs into a problem researching an obscure incident, he just um, kind of chooses the easiest solution. You throw accuracy out the window and kind of make it up as you go along. But Douglas Fairbanks, Jr., then and now, was never one to really compromise with any kind of historical detail. He needed to recreate two famous buildings, both of which had been demolished many years before. A castle, Knockmore, was destroyed when the French landed in Ireland. We'll talk more about that later. The second of these two buildings, the Dublin home of the Viceroy of Ireland, had been leveled by fire, and that was nearly a hundred years earlier. So researchers went to work. They went to Hollywood libraries and museums and they looked for lithographs and etchings and paintings or any information about the buildings themselves and they found just about nothing. So then they contacted the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York and the London Museum. And finally they received some rare prints of the Viceroy's home. Nothing of the castle though. Well finally one researcher had to go all the way to Ireland and come back again with pictures of the actual castle. And it took two years to complete the research and design the sets. Now, if you love the excitement of flaming action, the thrill of tempestuous romance, the joy of earthy humor, here's the screen event of your life. At least that's what the ad said. Here's Douglas Fairbanks, Jr. in The Fighting O'Flynn. Next on AMC, Alan Ladd leads a mutiny on the high seas in the exciting swashbuckler Two Years Before the Mast co-starring William Bendix and Brian Donlevy, next on AMC. And we continue now with our Swords and Swashbucklers Film Festival. I love every time I have to say that. Anyway, during World War II, uh, the movements of large ships around the United States coastline uh, was restricted. Now, this meant that Hollywood uh, could not make any of those great 19th century swashbucklers featuring all those magnificent sailing ships. Or, maybe they could. Two Years Before the Mass, that's the movie we're going to see, was written before the regulations actually went into place. And by the time the story went before the cameras, the war was raging. While the script called for many scenes at the open sea, the entire production was filmed on dry land on the Paramount lot. And remember that as you watch this film, because it's really hard to believe. Designs were based on real ships. Uh, uh, well, one particular ship, as a matter of fact, called the Pilgrim. There were just many versions of it. Uh, the Pilgrim sailed out of Boston back in the 19th century. It was a, a great, one of those two-masted square riggers, 127 feet long and 28 feet across the beam. Now, an exact replica was built in four sections on these double rockers to approximate sea movement that would go fore and aft and port and starboard and the whole thing. Now, there was a duplicate hull of this ship, and that was made for a 640,000-gallon tank, so that one was going on in there. Studio shipbuilders also constructed a special mast, just like the one that was on the other two ships, where the director, John Farrow, ran a school for all the sailors. Every member of this cast was taught to climb up the mast and to haul up the sails with some degree of proficiency before he could actually get on the picture. The leading man had no trouble at all on board ship. Alan Ladd had been at sea for 
well, uh, rulers of the sea was one, Captain Caution was another, the uh, souls of the sea, before taking the role of Charles Stewart aboard the Pilgrim. Well, here he is uh, with an epic adventure, really. It's called Two Years Before the Mast. This film had a really authentic feeling about it, and it really should have. In addition to being based on a true story, there are enough real sailors involved with the production to smooth out all the inaccuracies that could have happened along the way. The official technical advisor was Captain Fred Ellis, who was a former British merchant skipper who had sailed around the Horn. But he wasn't the only man on the set with sea legs. Uh, Blackie Whiteford was cast as one of the crewmen after 36 years as a sailor and 10 trips around the Horn. He retired from the sea to work as an extra in Hollywood. Nine other full-fledged sailors on the Pilgrim were men who specialized in playing sailors all the time. Further expertise was provided by director John Farrow. Now, at the time, he was a commander in the Royal Canadian Navy on special services in Southern California. And there was one touch of authenticity that nobody predicted. Almost everybody in the cast, except the sailors, got seasick. Now let's take a look at this. <laughs> 